At the beginning of the movie, we see an experienced fisherman heading out to sea. Like thousands of times before, he casts his net from the boat, but something goes wrong and the net gets caught on something on the ocean floor. The fisherman dives down, but he can't make it back to the surface as a huge school of fish surrounds him. Charlie, a lighthouse keeper, calls her colleagues in Germany to discuss current affairs. She's interrupted by a signal on her monitor and rushes off to investigate. Charlie has to swim to the duty buoy to dive into the water and retrieve a sensor that somehow got tangled up in fishing nets. Strange things are also happening in Canada. Leon, a young whale researcher, is called to Vancouver's city beach where a giant killer whale washed up a couple of hours ago. After examining the animal, he heads to the fishing dock to find out who among the poachers caused serious cuts to the killer whale. An old fisherman takes Leon to his boat and shows him the bitten side of the vessel which was used to try and overturn the killer whale. Leon doesn't believe this story but the man is sure that the fisherman wouldn't lie to him and that they had to destroy the whale to save themselves. Charlie and her new friend launch a repaired sensor into the ocean tasked with tracking marine animal population. They notice methane ice fragments around the boat which often rise to the surface but today there are too many of them. Leon finally hears the whales and learns that they have been seen in various locations along the coast. Before heading out to sea, he calls his girlfriend Lizzie, who has already taken Doris on her boat to see killer whales in the wild. A giant whale appears next to Leon's boat. After freezing for a couple of minutes, the giant disappears on the water, but a whole pod of orcas takes its place. Lizzie takes the tourists onto the deck and everyone watches in awe as the whales appear. The humpback giant also appears next to the ship and the tourists are able to see it up close. The strange behavior of the whale pleases everyone except Leon, who tries to warn his friend but is too late. The next trick of the whale hits the middle of the boat. Leon arrives at the scene of the accident and tries to save those who survived the hit, but now a pod of orcas is hunting for the tourists. Leon is unable to save Lizzie. The action shifts to a French restaurant. After gathering fresh seafood at the market, the chef plans to prepare lobsters, but one of them shoots an unknown liquid into the man's face. After wiping his face, the chef continues working, but by evening, he and two other cooks begin to feel ill. The chef passes away that same evening, and the two young cooks are taken to the ICU, waiting for the test results to determine what happened. At the same time, a Norwegian ship in the sea lowers a camera to study an unusual phenomenon, an invasion of ice worms. A few specimens are brought to the surface for study, and the scientist finds a new peculiarity. These creatures have jaws and reproduce several times faster. A commission is formed, and everyone agrees that they have discovered a new species of worms and bacteria. Leon talks to the owner of a fishing boat who was also a witness to the humpback whales attacking other boats the day before. In addition, Leon is shown another anomaly. The bottom of the ship that returned from the sea is covered with a thick layer of mollusks which has never been seen before. A group of scientists launches a sampler onto the seafloor to check the soil where worms were found. But due to a methane leak, an explosion occurs. The ship manages to survive, but the team is greatly frightened. The scientists are not only scared of the mistake during the operation, but also the results of the test. In addition to the worms on the seafloor, there are bacteria that eat ice and can reach the very bottom. Jess records a video message to Charlie when something strange suddenly happens and alarming readings appear on the monitors. The water under the ship starts boiling and something pulls it down into the depths. The action shifts to Venice. A young man in love reads poetry on a bridge when suddenly the book falls from his hands and ends up in the canal. The couple immediately forgets about the poetry book because before their eyes is an even stranger sight. Thousands of giant jellyfish rise to the surface. Analysis of the bacteria from the infected chef reveals a new strain that feeds on blood cells. It turns out that several more people have died after visiting the restaurant on the coast. Leon requests permission to perform an autopsy on the killer whale to find out how pollution affects whales and whether this could be related to changes in the behavior of these giants. There is nothing inside the whale that could scare the experts, but Leon finds an unknown substance in its brain, which is sent for analysis. Another victim of infection appears, a young man from a car wash. By putting together all the events, the scientists understand that the bacteria spread from the restaurant through the water supply system. Leon is informed of new cases of whale attacks. Looking at the map, the guy finds a pattern. All the changes occur with the whales during migration. To verify his suspicions, the guy sails to the place where the whales are resting during their sleep. The dive almost ends in tragedy, but Leon manages to install a camera on one of the whales and get out. Sigur finds out that the Japanese have also found the worms, but they are not in a hurry to report it to the world. Recordings from the cameras are checked in two laboratories at once. Leon's footage shows that the whale pod descended to the very bottom where they were met with strange glowing. 
Far from the events, a new incident occurs on the coast. Hordes of crabs crawl out onto the streets of a small village. Another shot of the seabed finally lifts the veil of mystery. It turns out that one of the oil and gas companies was drilling ice in a forbidden place and damaged the seabed for several kilometers. Leon has to sneak through a fence to get to the guarded port area to collect a few more mussels for analysis from the ship, but he is caught by security and arrested. In the morning, Mr. Sato, the Japanese owner of the ship, contacts Leon. He asks the guy not to trespass on his territory in this way again, but promises to provide access to all materials for study. Charlie only now receives the message recorded by Jess a few minutes before the tragedy. When the emotions subside, the girl manages to notice some peculiarities on the recording. For example, a glow behind the porthole. Crabs are being delivered to the laboratory, which have started to emerge on the surface in different parts of the world. As expected, they too are filled with a strange substance that absorbs blood cells at an incredible speed. Charlie is reviewing the video repeatedly, not understanding what else is wrong with it. Finally, the girl's hearing catches a sound that is very similar to the sound from the deep sea recording. The girl contacts the laboratory and shows them a part of the recording that caught her attention. But her stern boss, Katarina, rejects all the scientists' ideas, considering the sound on different recordings to be just random noise. She orders Charlie to finish up the work and shut down the station for the winter without coming up with incredible theories. But after cooling down and carefully considering Charlie's words, Katarina still decides to test this hypothesis. And a helicopter with a group of scientists and a deep water device arrives on the island. The device is delivered to the island by Sigor, and after handing it over to Charlie, he's about to leave. But at the same time, emergency messages come to the scientists on the mainland. They are only able to reach Sigor and inform him that a terrifying tsunami is approaching the coast. Those who see it with their own eyes realize that there is no chance of survival. Sigor manages to warn Charlie and they leave. At the conference, scientists give a report that the discovered bacteria intentionally infect humans and soon everyone will have to flee far away from water sources. Leon tries to warn his fisherman friends about this, but none of them are ready to live on land, choosing to die in their familiar environment. Rahim meets Leon at the institute to participate in a scientific conference. The best minds gather to discuss what is happening, and most agree that there is some force at work that wants to drive people out of the ocean. Only Katarina is against everyone else. She refuses to abandon the knowledge and convictions gained through years of experience, so she orders the group to seek a logical explanation based on science. Despite objections from their mentor, the group of scientists presents their theory to the public, convincing the government that marine inhabitants infected with bacteria are intentionally attacking humans. They even give the new intelligence a name, the Ur. However, such a version only elicits irony from top officials, who also suggest finding more scientific solutions to the problem than negotiating with an unknown intelligence. Astrophysicist Samantha Grove come to the scientists' aid. Unlike politicians, she carefully studied the report and agrees that the strange sound on different recordings is all the characteristics of an unfamiliar world language. In addition, her team managed to capture the exact same signal from Antarctica. Another influential person, Japanese Mifuno, also believes in Sigor's theory and agrees to finance his venture, hoping it will help to save the world. Sigor assembles the team and informs them of the start of the mission. He suggests everyone think carefully and assess the risks, and those willing to go all the way will be waiting for an expedition to the Arctic in 48 hours. The scientists go home to say goodbye to their loved ones and warn them of their departure. The relatives of many try to persuade them to stay, but everyone understands that this is their last chance to fix something. According to scientists' calculations, the largest accumulation of intelligent bacteria is located in one of the valleys in Antarctica, where they could have lived for millions of years prior. The company is preparing to establish contact, and everyone is playing their role while giving interviews to a young journalist. Finally, the equipment on the ship starts buzzing with interference, and the scientists prepare to capture a signal from the mysterious organism. Sarah, Mifuno's assistant, sits down next to Leon at the table and confesses to him that she would have never believed in their theory if it weren't for her boss, who has proven over many years that his intuition never fails. Samantha is devising a plan. She intends to add a sound of a human child scream to the organism's audio signal and return the recording to the intelligence to show that they are ready to communicate. Charlie asks her colleague to take her with him in the diving apparatus to the bottom. The ship drops anchor and the scientists begin transmitting the sound message. Meanwhile, the daring couple gets into the capsule and prepares to dive to the depths. The whole team is eagerly awaiting any reaction, and finally a movement appears on the radar and the sensors pick up a sound signal. 
The team from the capsule tries to contact the captain's bridge to report that their fans are malfunctioning and they are running out of oxygen, but communication is not working. The chief pilot Luther is ready to return, but Charlie notices some movement and turns off the lights, waiting to see what happens next. On the ship, they also notice something approaching. Seeger insists that the captain recall the submarine, but they can't reach the group. Luther doesn't want to risk anymore and he lifts the boat. On the ship, a hatch opens to receive the capsule into a special compartment. Charlie notices a strange glow appearing around them at that moment, but she doesn't tell anyone about it. Meanwhile, Samantha reports that they have managed to establish contact. The sound signal has returned and the child's cry has been altered as a sign that the bacteria understood the message from humans. Dr. Chase is looking for a way to cure those who have already been infected by the bacteria. Luther tells the journalist that he saw nothing at the depth and everything Charlie saw was probably a figment of her imagination, just like the whole idea of intelligence. Nevertheless, Samantha tries to decipher the error messages to assemble them into a response signal that the intelligence will understand. While staying in the compartment with the capsule, the journalist notices a glow in the pool. The lights on the ship go out and interference begins. When everything is restored, the captain sees the journalist's body fallen on the monitor. Chase tries to save the girl and on her lips she notices a liquid resembling cerebrospinal fluid. Samantha tells the team and the captain that during the voltage surge there was a signal surge and it was so low that no one heard it. But most importantly, in the opinion of the astrophysicist, it originated from inside the ship. Charlie listens to what her colleagues are saying, but she never musters the courage to tell them that they brought the bacteria into the pool. Leon visits the girl, whose body has become covered in strange spots. The doctor asks the guy and Sarah for help. They must hold the girl while she takes a sample of the spinal fluid for analysis. The doctor tells the team about the results of the analysis. The substance previously found in marine creatures was discovered in Alicia's spinal cord. Chase believes that bacteria were attempting to merge with the girl's cells, and Charlie admits to seeing the glowing enter the ship with them. Samantha records a new message for the Earth, this time including an audio image from the astrophysicist. Charlie goes down to the sealed compartment without permission, and the pool starts glowing again, creating unusual shapes with the light. At that moment, Samantha receives a response message from the entity, which also contains an image. Mr. Mifuno's helicopter lands on the ship as he wants to be present for the opening. Sigor shows him the recording from the pool cameras and the image sent in response to Samantha's message. According to the astrophysicist, they have an image of the super ocean that surrounded a supercontinent millions of years ago. According to the scientists, the Earth reminded them that they were, are, and will be on Earth much longer than humans, and all they want is for the oceans to be left alone and not destroyed. But there's good news, since the entity is responding to messages, the team has a chance to negotiate and reach a ceasefire. In the meantime, Chase devises a drug that can destroy bacteria that consume blood cells. This news creates disagreement within the team. Nifuno plans to test the substance in the pool, and if it works, completely destroy the Earth. Sigoy disagrees with this, at least until they confirm that they cannot negotiate with the Earth. Chase tries to take the middle ground and suggests trying the drug in the pool, but not rushing to launch it into the open ocean. Everyone gathers to watch the experiment. Chase launches the drug into the water, which immediately begins to rise, emitting a terrible scream that shatters the glass. The captain is informed that nothing is working on the ship, and they are simply drifting in the waters of Antarctica. But worse, the ship is surrounded by icebergs. The vessel collides with an iceberg, but unexpectedly, a blue glow takes it somewhere else. The captain orders the engines to be started to break free from the control of the air. He also doesn't understand why they don't pour all the drug they have on board into the water. But Seeger tries to explain to the captain that everything that happened now is the price for his thoughtless experiment in the pool. And no one in the world will manufacture enough of the substance to destroy Ur worldwide. The only way out is to make a truce. While the team is deciding how to negotiate with the Ur, the entity traps the ship between the icebergs. Charlie hurries to the capsule to descend and deliver Luther's body to Ur as a sign of complete obedience. Once at depth, Charlie changes a plan. She injects leukocytes into her heart that can merge with Ur and opens the capsule door. The body falls under the control of Ur and the icebergs release the ship, while billions of lights envelop the girl underwater. Later, Charlie brings the ship to a deserted island. It opens its eyes and looks at the sky with glowing blue eyes. The series ends here. Please write in the comments what you think about this series.